Today I'm in Great Yarmouth in the east coast of England. The town is known for its sandy beach and today I'm meeting a developer who is converting the office block behind me into 30 apartments. So if you're interested in learning on how to do projects and development at this level, watch this video and you'll learn how to develop, how to finance and how to exit such a development. Come along with me as I meet Richard and he's going to tell you more about how he's doing this right here in Great Yarmouth. This is the show flat. This is what people can expect. This is a one bed. This is a very large one bed. It was originally designed as a two bed. It just didn't, didn't quite work. You would have walked in here, along a corridor here, turned here along a corridor here, and walked into your kitchen living room there. And then you would have been standing in the second bedroom there, right? So it would have been this quite small, boxy second bedroom, and you'd have had this long, dark corridor going from the entrance and the bedroom through into your living space, and decided that actually it was much better as a dining room, living room, kitchen, all in one. You've got quite nice views from here. Yeah, you can see the sea in the distance. And then it's quite an interesting view because you, you see all these different car parks, people walking around and stuff. Cooking, dining, sitting, media. Cooking, eating, living, media wall. That's the general idea of the design. Looking out over quite an interesting view. It's a bit industrial, but like the fields beyond is beautiful. Again, shower room, a little bit smaller. Okay, but these are like compact flats, a reasonable size bedroom. And again, spectacular views. You've got five flats on each floor, Michael. Okay, we've got four two beds and a one bed, and, and they're all stacked on top of each other. So. The fifth floor is identical to the fourth floor to the third floor, they're all the same. We've got a sixth floor on this building, so we've got a roof space on this building. If there's enough interest from the new residents, I will build 30 storage units up on that sixth floor. If you live in a flat, if you live in a small flat, like where do you put your golf clubs? Where do you put your suitcases? You know, it's, it's challenging, so they're gonna put them all up there. Valentin is one of my plumbers. No, how long have you been here? Not long, three, three weeks, four weeks, something like that, maximum. Yeah. Um, have you made any major mistakes yet? No. I like him. Let's go. So, look, Andrea is a Tyler extraordinaire. A fantastic Tyler, actually. I know that I can leave him for the day and he just cracks on. He just belts through the square meterage. There were holes in tiles where there shouldn't have been. So Andrea has to bust those tiles out. You can see all the mess. And it, he puts the new tiles in. This is my guy, Carlos. He fixes all the mistakes. He's very talented. Right, how are we getting on, fellas? Yeah, we're uh, getting... Uh... We got the first one in? Yeah, we did enough. Just a bit. The common sense at the end of the day. Yeah. Scaling up. Okay, the key is to take it in stages. This is 24,000 square feet. It is a completely different animal to doing one or two units, especially if you want to do the building work yourself. You've also got to understand that if you've done 10 one unit schemes and a couple of three unit schemes, and then you find a building like this and you think, I'm going to convert this into 30 flats. You go to a lender, they'll say to you, how many schemes like this have you done? And you say, well, I've done 10 single unit schemes and I've done this three unit scheme. And they'll say, no, no, thank you. you. You don't have the experience. We're not going to trust you with our money when you've never done a building anything approaching the size of this before. Okay. So you have to take it in stages. So what did I do? I did. A bunch of single unit flips. I spent 10 years as a contractor as well. So the three unit scheme gave was the springboard to the 11 unit scheme, right? 
The 11 unit scheme was the springboard to the 28 unit scheme. Now, 28 units to 30 units, you would think it was kind of similar, but it was a completely different animal. Okay. Two and a half times the size, yeah, okay. 24,000 square feet, six stories, not three stories, okay. six stories, and a concrete frame building with nothing there. So when I bought this building, these floors were completely empty, stripped back to the concrete. Okay. And so we had to build everything. Yeah, massive, massive step up because because not only am I the developer on this, so I have all the developer responsibilities when it comes to funding, reporting to investors, dealing with the planning uh, department, dealing with building control, so on and so forth. I'm also the main contractor. Okay. So on any given day, I have anything up to sort of 30, 35 people on site, and they're all reporting into me. Could you give us an example of how one small little thing that could go wrong, whereby if you're dealing with a two oh. unit scheme, it's a, you know, you can easily rectify oh. it. On a 30 unit scheme, when you spend 10 pounds in each flat, you've spent 300, yeah? Yeah. When you've spent 100 pounds in each flat, you've spent three grand, yeah? When you spend 1,000 pounds in each flat, you've spent 30,000 pounds. And to spend 1,000 pounds in a flat is dead easy. To make 100 pounds worth of mistakes in each flat, absolutely no doubt you're going to do it. Can you see this, this socket here? Yeah? If the electricians, four months ago, put their spat boxes in at the wrong height, that's three times 30, which is 90 sockets to change. Just one simple mistake, socket's too low. They have to move 90 sockets, okay? Now these are all plasterboard balls, right? So if they move the socket from there to there, they also have to patch, it's a soundproof wall, right? So someone then has to come and repair that socket there, times 90. Okay, that, that doesn't happen in a day, right? That's days and days of work. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands and thousands of pounds, just because a socket was put in too low. And so it's very, very easy for budgets to be blown, yeah? Costs to explode. This kitchen run, this door and this wall are built roughly here. This is a space for the fridge freezer. So in the floor below, when you open the door, you'll hit the fridge freezer. And the kitchen fitters have installed the kitchen below and not realized that the floor below was different to this floor, which is acceptable. But what does it mean? They have to take all this down, take all this out, remove this worktop, they have to move all these electrics. They have to cut this panel here and they have to cut this panel here to move this all across. All because when the person who built that wall built that wall downstairs, they moved it over. So they didn't follow the plans. They just built what they wanted to build and it's come home to roost now, six months later, while the guys are trying to fit the kitchens. And that is not cheap to do. Well, it's that sort of mistake is multiplied 30 times, you get the idea of why these things are so expensive. On this project, out of my budget of 1,150,000, I reckon it's cost me minimum 10%. I think I could have saved over 100,000 pounds if I hadn't had the delays and the issues that I've had. It is kind of a redundant statement because a project of this size is always going to be challenging. This is a perfect example of how money gets wasted, right? There are over 200 doors in this building, okay? And the chippies, the carpenters, when they were fitting them, they were told that they had to paint inside here black because then you don't see it, it disappears. They haven't done it, the bloody idiots. So now Carlos has to go around, unscrew those, paint that black and screw them back on. So that's 200 times he has to go zip, zip, mm, zip, zip. That doesn't happen in minutes. I bought this building with planning permission to convert it to 30, 29 flats. Okay. okay. Planning permission. Now with that planning permission came a big section 106 bill. As a private developer, when I do a multi-unit scheme of this size, the local authority wants some cash from me. This was a B1 office block, okay? 
Now, under the rules introduced by David Cameron in 2012, you can convert a B1 office block into residential without the benefit of planning permission. It's called, it's commonly known as permitted development, all right? So under permitted development, there is no section 106 to pay. So I submitted an application for conversion under permitted development from office to residential, and they didn't respond within 56 days. So thank you very much. I had Dean consent. But this local authority here in Great Yarmouth, they weren't very happy with that. So when I then submitted a planning application to change these windows, the original planning application was for windows brick up to here and windows above. I wanted full height windows. We put the application in for windows and the council gave us so much pushback because the original windows on this building had a triangular top. So we had this big battle, can't do triangular tops, you must do triangular tops, can't do triangular tops, you must. Actually after 12 months, they agreed to have a sit down with me. And then the day after that meeting, the conservation officer, who's part of the planning department, he phoned me up and he said, will you please do some full height windows? I couldn't believe my luck. But he wanted three tiers of full height windows. So I gave him them, and I think they look absolutely spectacular. So we started with a budget for construction of 1.47 million. My previous business partner came on site, he did some work, and the monitoring surveyor signed it off, and he got paid 700,000 pounds, got paid half the budget. I got wise to the situation, and I realized that he hadn't done anything like 700,000 pounds worth of work. And that's why I got rid of him. And then I was left with 1,150,000 pounds. And what I had was walls and ceilings on three floors. Now, in the end, it turned out that those walls and ceilings were actually kind of worse than useless because all the electrical work failed inspection, all the plumbing work leaked, and there was no drainage. So I was left with 1,150,000 to effectively convert 24,000 square feet of office block, which is about 40 pounds a foot. At this stage, money disappears very quickly, but I'm pretty sure that I will just have the last pound to pay for the last pound of bills. We have three tiers of money on this project, three tiers. We've got a senior lender or a first charge lender. They provide the vast majority of the money. Uh, I used to come a lender called Blend, run by a guy called Jan Merciano. Then I had to get a little slice of what's called MEZ, mezzanine debt, second charge debt, which is more expensive than first charge debt. And I got that from a chap called Daryl Thorpe. Then the third charge or the third tier of money was the investors. We did what's called a bond issue to our investors. Okay, It's kind of a fancy loan agreement, but it gets round the issue of collective investment schemes. Just to recap then, the stack, you had Blend, who have the first charge, the majority of the money, and charge the lease for it because it's the lowest risk. So they get their money back first. Daryl Thorpe, Seven Bridging was the second charge or MES lender. And then I used a crowdfunding platform called Crowd With Us to do the bond issue to my six investors. In order to do a collective investment scheme, you have to be FCA regulated. The moment you have more than one person on a loan agreement, that is a collective investment scheme. What makes that really toxic in terms of regulation uh, and FCA requirements is if those investors are retail investors. So if they've never invested in anything else in their lives and they put all their life savings into a flip that you're doing, then they're retail investors in an unregulated collective investment scheme that goes wrong potentially and they lose all their money and then they claim, they complain to the FCA and the FCA comes after you. And that's jail time, wow. potentially. How do you get around all this regulation? First of all, don't deal with retail investors. If you have more than one person who's going to invest in your scheme, 
then you need to do a bond issue. So now any bond issue has to be done by a regulated party. So that's like by a peer-to-peer -peer platform or a crowdfunding platform, or if you're becoming a big developer, just become regulated yourself. It's not actually that difficult. You've got to pass some exams, pay a fee, and that's it. You get into the world of sophisticated investors, high net worths, and now there's a new tier called professional investors. There's a lot of misinformation around this particular aspect of funding. Sophisticated investors are typically people who uh, work in the finance field, that sort of thing. And then there's high net worth. Now high net worth in the FCA world means that you've got quarter of a million quid either in cash or assets outside of your main family home. But what does it all mean? So what if you're a sophisticated investor or a high net worth or a retail investor? What does that all mean? Okay, so all of this is, it's the regulation around marketing your development as an opportunity to invest. You want to be dealing with sophisticated investors or high net worths or professional investors. Type number one, is the institutional investor, okay? That's like pension companies, uh, FTSE 250 companies, uh, insurance companies. Um, they are institutional investors. Now, you're not really interested in those guys until you've got like 150 staff uh, and you're building hundreds of, possibly thousands of units a year. Pool number two out of our three pools of investors. Yeah is the high net worths. A high net worth is someone who's worth millions. Yeah, not someone who's worth a few hundred thousand. We're talking someone who's worth 10 million and above. The key with high net worths is to chase the relationship. Where do I find them? Where do I find this? All high right, net worth? so high net worths do hang out with other high net worths. Where have I, yeah. where have I recently had success finding high net worths? Okay. London's cigar bars. And you just strike up a conversation with the person at the table next to you. I met a guy, a really fascinating guy, decamillionaire, liked him immediately, still like him. Because I like to be honest from the outset, you know? I like to say things like, look, I know you're not gonna be ready to invest in any of my schemes soon, but I am gonna want you to at some point but let's get to know each other first. And it took three years. Item number three yes. is the family offices. Well, yeah, of course, yeah, the Rockefellers or the company that started Fiat, people who've made hundreds of millions, possibly billions. Yeah. And then they have obviously layers of management. So if it gets through the first tier of analysis, it goes up to the next tier and, and then it will go up to the credit committee. And if the credit committee says, yes, we like it, we're going to invest, they will invest. So where do you find the family offices? Probably a lesson for another time. I can't You're give it, I can't give it all away because for the young entrepreneurs and developers watching, yes. right? When you need capital, when you want to scale up and do a project like this, the capital, you're going to get your capital from a family office. That is the place to go because the institutional is too big. The high net worths take too long. The family office, that's where you're going to get the money. And I'm not going to tell you where to find them. I'm sorry. Are you selling them from day one while, yeah. while it's off plan? What's the, what's the process around that? So, Are you some? No. Okay. No, I'm going to sell all 30. They're all available for sale. Let's put this building in context. This building is an iconic building in this town. Everybody above a certain age knows it because... It used to be the job center on the ground floor. So this building has been empty for eight or nine years before I bought it. No one in this town believes this building is ever going to be finished. Is there a plan B in terms of exiting? Because you, no. you no. have to sell. I have to sell. I don't want to keep this building. Does help the buy scheme apply to me? Oh, yes, it does. That's a big help because also nobody else in Great Yarmouth is offering help to buy units. So this will be the only development in town that has help to buy. So first time buyers will be able to buy a flat here with a deposit as little as four and a half thousand pounds. The best flat in the building, which is where we did most of the interview, 
Uh, most of the content was flat number 30. That's 180,000 pounds. So your deposit is nine. Your last words of wisdom to all, all right, those Michael. developers who are okay. trying to be like you. You've come on a particularly hard day on the Crown House site in Great Yarmouth. Quite a lot of what I've said is talked about challenges, yeah. right? So let's talk about the joys, yeah. all right? So look, if you get it right, yeah, property development will make you a shit ton of money. Yeah, there is a big fat pot of gold at the end of the rainbow if you get it right. And you get it right by taking it in stages. Don't go from one unit to 30 units. Go one to five to 15 to 25 to 35 to 50 and beyond. And it's like making money is like falling off a log. OK, but you've got to get there. You've got to take your time to get there. You've got to build your relationships with your high net worth. You've got to smoke those cigars. You've got to drink that whiskey. You've got to strike up conversations. You've got to meet some people. You've got to get out there. You've got to find your investors. All right. But it is all worth it because typically at the end of the week, when I'm driving back to Fulham, which is where I live, I got a big smile on my face because at the end of the day, I love all this. So it is all worth it in the end, people. Until next time, guys, subscribe, like, comment, tell us what more content you want. And we're going to bring you more people like Richard who are going to be helping you advance on your journey of property investment. I'll see you next time. Thank you.